let's go ahead and turn it away to our experts, Molly and Elizabeth. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Reese, and I'm an assistant curator of the Fish and Invertebrates Unit here at the museum. Um, and I'll be here helping answer any questions that you have throughout the talk, um, either in the chat box or any that are asked out loud. Um, and I'm really excited about this talk because we're going to be talking about my favorite aquatic arthropod, mantis shrimp. And I know that's a few other people's favorites as well. That was perfect. Hi guys, I am Molly Asher. I am the curator of fish and invertebrates here at the museum. And I had the opportunity to study some aquatic arthropods while I was getting my PhD. So my favorite aquatic, aquatic arthropod of all time is the horseshoe crab. It's another one that we're gonna be talking about today. So with that, let's get started. Let me share my screen with you. Once I figure out how to do it. Share screen, cool. You got this. <laughs> Calm down, okay, share. <laughs> Everyone can see? Looks great. Okay. Yeah. I am ready to go. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us to learn about amazing aquatic arthropods. I hope you guys have had the opportunity to learn about other arthropods to, uh, during Bug Fest. Uh, I can't go forward. Oh, I have to press this button. I got it. Cool. Okay, so maybe uh, we can go have a quick overview about what makes an arthropod an arthropod. Now in the chat box, if you guys have had any opportunity to visit some of these other bug fest um, events, can you think of any characteristics that makes an arthropod an arthropod? Some of you guys may have some answers and others may be just learning this for the first time. And Laura B LB is gonna um, give us some options if she hears it. Awesome. So Rachel and Stephen are both saying jointed appendages. Those are great, great terms. Preston says it has an exoskeleton. What else, what else makes an arthropod? I'm sure Molly will give us some, uh, some more pointers. I will, guys, this is so wonderful. I um, am, that is actually my first couple of points. So first of all, arthropods have an exoskeleton. The exoskeleton is made of chitin that the animal produces itself. It's like a, a suit of armor that goes around the animal and it does not grow with the animal as the animal grows. So it has to be molted or shed as the animal grows and then they grow a new one. Also, great job, they have jointed appendages. Actually, arthropod means jointed foot in Latin. Um, so they have these hinges. They're usually one directional, like a door hinge, but they can be surprisingly flexible. Arthropods typically are also have an open circulatory system. So unlike us, we have veins and arteries that pump blood throughout um, our bodies, but arthropods act only have, uh, they, their blood gets pumped just through their entire body cavity without going through veins and arteries. And finally, they have a segmented body with a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Sometimes the head and the thorax are combined into a cephalothorax. So those are just some characteristics of typical arthropods. Now there are a lot of arthropods that are found in the aquatic environment. So in oceans and rivers and streams and lakes. So about, uh, from the about a million species of arthropods, 68 or so, 68,000 of them or so live in the aquatic environment. Most of those are crustacean species. Those are gonna be your lobsters and your crabs and your shrimp. Some of them are your sea spider species. Those are totally different, unique organism that we don't have time to talk about today. And then there are four species of horseshoe crabs. Now again, there's not enough time to cover everything. So we're only gonna talk about three of them today. Mantis shrimp, holla, which is Elizabeth's favorite um, aquatic arthropod. Oh, I can't do that, sorry. Horseshoe crabs which is mine, and decorator crabs, which are just incredible organisms anyways. And we're gonna start off with mantis shrimp. So mantis shrimp are uh, fascinating organisms. They are one of the coolest and most unique organisms on the face of the planet. They have many different names. They're called prawn killers or sea locusts, or in the aquarium trade, they're known as thumb splitters. All reasons that we're going to, all of what those reasons we may get into uh, as we go through this talk. So because these organisms are so different and unique and they have all these fun facts about them, I've laid out a, a, a list of eight fun facts about mantis shrimp for you to take home and, and remember how incredible these organisms are. Fun fact number one, they're not actually, oh, that didn't show up correctly. Oh, there it comes, hey, they're not actually shrimp. So I know I said they're mantis shrimp, but they're not mantises and they're not shrimp. So they're actually an organism called a stomatopod. Now, stomatopods split at a long time in evolutionary history. It split off from the rest of the crustaceans many years ago. Um, and they, so they are not 
crab, shrimp, or lobsters, they are a totally separate lineage. And so they've had a long time to develop characteristics that are unique to any other organism on the planet. Second fun fact is that they are older than dinosaurs. Now these organisms split off from the other crustaceans about 400 million years ago, and that, which is 170 million years before the first dinosaurs appeared on the scene. So they're very prevalent in the fossil record. And they, again, I wanna reiterate that they've, because they've had this separate lineage for so long, they have not had an opportunity to, um, they, or they've had an opportunity to evolve so many fascinating and unique characteristics that are not found otherwise in the animal kingdom. And now I'm going to try to go slower because I realize I'm talking too fast. <laughs> okay, fun fact number three. Their species are class classified by their murder method. Now, first of all, I don't mean murder. I mean the way that they are going to catch their prey. And there are about 450 species, and some of them are spearing organisms, and some of them are smashing organisms. Spearing organisms also tend to live in, in soft substrates, whereas smashing organ, smashers or clubbers tend to live in harder substrates, and all of them live in little burrows inside the ground. So does anyone, and we're going to get into this in more details in a little while, but you've got spears and you've got smashers. They also differ in the types of food that they're going to go after. Can you guys take a guess at which one of them is going to be better at taking on things with hard shells? And that's probably too easy of a question because the picture kind of shows it. <laughs> but I, I, oh yeah, it does kind of show it. Okay, Preston thinks smashing and so does Ruxin <laughs> and iPad. <laughs> Great job, guys. I really appreciate it. I realized that I could have picked better pictures for this. But <laughs> yeah, the smashers are very good at going after hard substrates. So we're gonna talk about the spearing organisms first. So this is a video that shows this um, uh, mantis shrimp going after its prey in real time. Oh, the video works. Wow, it happened so fast. And I don't know if you can hear the clicking sound. You might not be able to, but um, it doesn't, now the clicking isn't happening in either of these. So the mantis shrimp are buried in their sediments, in their burrows, and they are able to take on these vertebrates, these fish. Um, man, these Spearing organisms have two sharp appendages on the front of their bodies, built for harpooning their prey. Now, this harpoon goes about 10 times slower than the smashing species punch, but obviously it's extremely effective because they're able to pull that fish right into their burrow. And they don't just go after fish, they go after, there are other videos of them taking on an eel or an octopus or a, a squid. They go after so many different types of organisms and they're very effective. So maybe it's hard to see that when it's in real time. So this is a slowed down version of it. And you can see this mantis shrimp go forward and harpoon that fish and it disappears into the sediment. Pretty cool. And I would say smashing mantis shrimp are pretty awesome. However, clubbing mantis shrimp are even crazier. I meant spearing animals. I might have said smashing, whatever. The smashing ones are absolutely incredible. And because they're so unique and incredible, it is actually our fun fact number four, that some mantis shrimp have extremely powerful punches. And I know you're like, okay, they're powerful, but no, they're really powerful. Let me explain how. Well, let me show you a video first. <laughs> so this is a video, you can hear it. Sorry if it's loud, I'll just be quiet. See that clicking sound? That's the sound of its club going forward. And it is very effective against crabs and shells and mussels. Listen, you guys hear it? That, it sounds like a snap to me. Yeah, that snap that happens, you can actually hear these snapping sounds on a coral reef. If you ever have been snorkeling on coral reefs or diving on coral reefs, you hear this like almost crackling sound in the water. And that's the sound of a lot of these mantis shrimp, but other types of snapping shrimp that it's just the sound of them snapping their claws or going after a predator or a, a prey item or something. So that looks pretty impressive. Let, oops, sorry. Let me walk it down for you. So not only are these punches very fast, but they're also extremely strong. But how fast and how strong are they? They go forward at 50 miles per hour with 160 pounds of force. The acceleration is quicker than that of a 22 caliber bullet. And it's 50 times faster than the blink of an eye. So this, so these, these clubbing animals have this modified club that's like, it's called a dactyl club. And it's, it, it is used for punching prey, punching or smashing them and breaking into shells specifically. So how strong are these punches? It breaks the shells of prey and the claws and all of that stuff that you would think it would. Um, but it can also break human fingers to the bone, uh, which is why in the aquarium trade, sometimes they're called thumb splitters. But it can also break aquarium glass. So they don't make great 
pets if they are in an aquarium that's made of glass because they will actually shatter that glass. But that's not even the coolest part. So they, their punches create cavitation bubbles. I don't know if anyone's ever heard of a cavitation bubble, but it is absolutely insane. I just, I laugh because of how insane this is. So when the club hits the shell, it hits at such a fast speed and with such fast force that they, the club and the shell separate quickly enough that it creates a bubble of super low pressure. Now, this cavitation bubble is a super heated bubble that also produces a flash of light. When I mean super heated, I mean the bubble reaches the temperature of the surface of the sun. So 4,400 Celsius is the temperature at which this bubble produce, it, it produces, and it creates a flash of light. Now, when that bubble collapses, there's a shock wave that goes out from it. So even it that's damaging and can stun and or kill the prey, even if the mantis shrimp missed its target. So it gets the punch and then it gets the shock wave after it. The water, the cavitation bubble, the water gets so hot it boils instantly and produces a flash, flash of light. So don't know about you, the cavitation bubbles and the fact that mantis shrimp can produce them with their punches is pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, we have some amazed people here in the chat. And someone made a comment, it's kind of like a pistol shrimp. Is, is that another name for a mantis shrimp? Is that a different kind of species? Or is that just the nickname that, that our iPad friend made up? <laughs> uh, no, I think they're very similar. I, off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to that. Elizabeth, our um, intrepid researcher at the moment, is going to look up that answer. That's a great question. And I should know the answer to that off the top of my head, but I want to make sure that's it's the correct okay. answer. It might be slightly different, or maybe they're the same thing. Yeah, that's okay. They're saying that it's a different species, which, yeah, um, yeah we will clarify, but they're probably right. Um, okay. That is crazy. And Chris wanted to know, just before you move on, in that video that you showed us where we can hear the, like, the snap or the, the pop really loudly, did it just take off that crab's claw and then keep going? <laughs> so, the um, you can't really tell in that video. So in the first part of this video, uh, oh, I, wow, I have to go back so far. In the first part of it, I'll just turn the volume down on this, the, when it snaps it off, I think that there's a potential that it actually just dropped the claw. You can't really tell in that one. In the second one, though, it does look like it did pop off its actual arm. But I, I, if I'm not mistaken, the, sometimes the crabs will, if they're faced with predation, they will just drop their claw. So in the first one, it looks like it might have just dropped it to get away from the vantage shrimp. But in this one, it, it looks like, at least, that um, it did a great job at trying to get away. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't even know that crabs could, could do that, could drop their claw. It's a good, that's a good defense mechanism, though. <laughs> okay, so I talked about cavitation bubbles, but I should have started with the fact that I have a video of it. It's in slow motion, obviously, because it's too fast. So in this video, this is the mantis shrimp. This is its eyeball. The red is the dactyl club, and this black part here is the shell that it's gonna to try to break open. So you can see it go forward, and it's gonna go slow down even more. This is the cavitation bubble. Cavitation bubble, sorry. Um, and you can see it go forward enough times. So right at that moment, the water is boiling. It reaches the surface of the sun. It produces a shock wave, and there's a flash of light. That's incredible. <laughs> so if you want amazing aquatic arthropods, this one's pretty amazing. Wow. So, yeah. if I were to punch something at 50 miles an hour, I would break every bone in my hand. So how are these animals able, how are their clubs able to survive such force over and over and over again? It is because, nope, you're gonna get that again. Okay, their clubs have shock absorbers. So beneath their hard-coated clubs, they have special layers of, of elastic polyside chitin. Now, the special part about this is the structure that it's made into, and it's called a Boulangon structure, and it keeps small cracks from becoming full breaks. Now, this is exciting for humans because researchers have been studying this structure, and they've created a new type of carbon fiber material that they are using to make better body armor for soldiers, better aircraft panels and car frames, and also football helmets. So we are able to create better safety measures for humans because we've been studying the structure of mantis shrimp clubs. So they have shock absorbers. And all of this punching thing is not even close to the craziest thing about this animal. Well, okay, it's, it's very, it's definitely one of the craziest things. But there's also another crazy thing, factoid number six. They have amazing eyes. Now, this will take me a second to go through it, and I'm just going to screw the surface on this because it's very complicated. But um, basically, if you think about a dog, a dog has two, okay, so in any eye, you're going to have cones, and your cones are going to tell you, are going to dictate what kind of colors you can see. So a dog has two cones. It has a blue one, and it has a green one. 
um, or it can, it can sense blue and green. Humans have three cones. We have red, blue, and green cones. But because our brains are able to see the world and then process those images, we are able to blend those colors, which means we can see uh, over a hundred different types of colors and we can distinguish between lilac and purple because we are able to blend the colors and tell the difference between them. Anyone want to take a guess? So dogs have two cones, humans have three cones. And look at all the colors we can see. Anyone want to take a guess on how many cones mantis shrimp have? Okay, Jackson thinks five. Jennifer says nine. Dee Hawkins says 15. Preston said four. Ruxin says 100. Marianne said 1,000. Oh. And we're going to five, 16, five. I think you need to tell us. All right, this is great answers, guys. Um, so there's a little bit of a debate at first whether it was between these two numbers, but between 12 and 16 cones, which is an enormous amount. Think of how many colors that we can see with just three. They have like 12 cones. How insane is that? So it's pretty exciting. And oh, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to show you the picture. Sorry, there you go. <laughs> Not only can they see all these different colors, they can also see UV light and infrared light. So for a long time, researchers thought that mantis shrimp had the best, they were deemed the, you know, the king of color vision for the, all of the animal kingdom, that they had the best color vision ever. However, they're actually not very good at determining, at, at differentiating between different colors um, in, in some experiments. And they think it's because, again, this evolutionary lineage that went off totally separate from any other animal, their brains work differently than ours. Whereas our brains are able to process those images and blend those colors. They think that uh, mantis shrimp brains act more like a satellite where they see the image and it goes right to their reaction center so they can respond almost immediately to their environment, but they aren't able to really process those colors and blend them. That's the hypothesis is that these animals aren't actually blending those colors. So they actually can't see all those fascinating colors that we think they would be able to if they had 12 or 16 color cones. But it's still pretty incredible how much they can see because they can also see UV light and infrared light. However, additionally, not only can they have all these colors, but they also, each eye can move independently. I don't, my little square is covering that area. So you can see in this GIF that their eyes are moving separately. And this allows them to have trinocular vision, which means it can gauge depth and distance on its own by focusing on objects in three separate regions of its eye. And it can see polarized light. Now, this whole thing is like very, very much something that is hard for me to understand, but they can see polarized light and especially they can see circular polar, circular polarizing light, which is unheard of in any other animal in the animal kingdom. No other animal can see circular polarizing light. And because of that, they have all these things that they can do with the ability to see this light. And we're going to get into them in the next factoid, but it also gives them the opportunity potentially this type of eye would allow them to determine, to tell the difference between cancer cells versus healthy cells because cancer cells reflect light differently than do healthy cells. So they would be able to basically tell if a cell or if a tissue is cancerous before it turns into a tumor. And now researchers are actually creating a prototype sensing camera that would be able to take pictures and use the technology that they would get from the, very similar to the eyes of a mantis shrimp to be able to look at tissues and decide if the tissue is, or and tell if the tissue is healthy or cancerous before tumor is even available or even there to be seen, which is pretty incredible. However, I don't think that the mantis shrimp are probably diagnosing cancer. So they do other things with this ability to detect circular polarizing light. One of which is the fact that they have a secret language using this ability to detect circularizing polarized light. So horseshoe, uh, not horseshoe crabs, that's next, just kidding. The ma no, I'm not kidding, I'm sorry. Okay. It's okay. Mantis shrimp, I'm getting ahead of myself. Mantis shrimp are, mantis shrimp such as the species, the tiger mantis shrimp is covered, and other species as well, are, are covered in these iridescent spots. And those iridescent spots are going to reflect light differently and allow the animal to reflect and detect this circularizing polarized light. So they can communicate to each other. They can communicate to, you know, conspecific uh, or same species competitors. So in this picture right here, this mantis shrimp is in a very defensive position. He's inside of his burrow with his butt deep inside, but he's got his head and his tail out. And those red spots are, are highlighted to show those are the areas where you've, they're reflecting circularized polarizing, circular polarizing light. So other mantis shrimp can see that and avoid it if they're like, I'm not going to compete with that. But other predators wouldn't notice that and be attracted to that predator or to that animal. So it'd be safe. Pretty cool secret language if you ask me. 
And our fa final factoid for today is the fact that some species, some species mate for life. And this is, it seems, you know, normal, but actually in the crustacean species, it is very unusual for something to mate for life. And so it's going to, it's going to share food, shelter, and raise their offspring with the same individual over the course of its life. This is very, ben very beneficial for organisms that live on the outskirts of, re of reefs, like some of these mantis shrimp, where they're not living into the, in the heart of the action. So if they have their partner with them on the outskirts, they have everything they need. They can catch their food, they have their mates, everything on the outskirts without having to risk going into the center of the reef. And these pictures show the eggs that these mantis shrimp are able to produce, which is a lot, which is pretty exciting. So, that was so much information in a very short amount of time, but hopefully you understand why Elizabeth thinks that this is her absolute favorite aquatic arthropod of all time. Does anyone have any questions? Not that yes. we've already them. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, we've answered some of the questions along the way, um, but we, we did have some, several other questions. And I also want to say that you have made, done a great job making the mantis shrimp sound amazing because they are. Um, Rexon even said that he wants to be a mantis shrimp. So, <laughs> um, okay, so first off, um, let's see, what makes them different than the kind of shrimp that we might eat as seafood? And also, can we eat mantis shrimp? That is, those are both absolutely great questions. So what makes them different from totally, they have the same appearance of mantis shrimp and they, and a lot, and they are still crustaceans. So they're still in that same family. They have similar characteristics, um, but I guess, all of those different characteristics, the way their brains work and other aspects of their, of the one stuff that we've talked about separate them from the traditional shrimp. It's a great question to ask, like exactly what are the exact characteristics, characteristics that make a shrimp versus make a mantis shrimp? And I don't know that off the top of my head, but you can still eat these, not very, right? I'm just getting my confirmation. Um, they're in certain cultures, you can eat them. And, um, but so, sorry, I forgot to say the size. Some of them are like four inches. Others are like as long as my forearm. So depending on the size, you might not want the snack sized, but the bigger ones would have enough meat on it to eat in certain cultures. Right. And I imagine they might be harder to catch and they also might be, you know, harder to find. So Jennifer wanted to know where do they live? That is a great question. They are found all over the, all over the place. And, um, they, in all different areas of the world, depending on the specific uh, species, so some are coral reef species, some are found elsewhere, and Elizabeth is here to answer some of these questions, because she is the expert on this. Take it away. I'm muting myself. Wait. Yeah, so there's a species that is actually native to North America called the American mantis shrimp that's found all the way from Massachusetts to the Gulf of Mexico, so you can probably find them on, in North Carolina. And there was a news article that was from a few years ago that somebody actually saw one washed up on the beach. Wow, that is super cool. Um, that okay, so, so oh. that's okay. I know we have a lot uh, more to talk about, so I am just gonna do two more questions about our mantis shrimp. And, um, and then after that, we'll move on to our next cool creature. And if we have mantis shrimp questions, we'll answer them in the chat or save them for the very end. So our next two questions, um, do they carry their eggs around with them or do they have a nest? They carry their eggs around with them. Um, they're, it's going to be, it, it looks like in that picture that it's holding it very like, much right there, but they're like a lot of other crustaceans, they're going to carry it in their swimmerette area, like underneath their body. And it's not too distracting, but they're also, they very much do stay in their burrows. So they, they create this little, little crevice of a burrow and they spend a lot of their life in there unless they're out hunting. So yes, they're still gonna be kind of attached to them, but they're also in their burrow. So it's kind of both, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that does. Um, okay, and then this was a response. Well, this was a question in response to the, um, the slide about their eyesight. So, because it sounds like they have a lot going on and they sound really intelligent. So how big is their brain compared to, you know, body size? I do not know the answer to that at all. I apologize. I That's couldn't okay. even venture a guess. I think Elizabeth might be able to check back in later and answer that question, but um, I currently do not know the answer. But that's a great idea because they do seem like very intelligent organisms. Yeah, and I, I think as a, you know, human society, global human society, we're learning a lot more about different creatures and just learning that a lot of them are more intelligent than we ever 
previously thought. So I can imagine that that might be the same case for the mantis shrimp. All yeah. right, so there are a couple more questions, but like I said, we're gonna save them for the very end and we're gonna talk about our next critter so that we have enough time. So go Great. ahead. Thank you so much, I appreciate this. Okay, our next one is horseshoe crabs. That's why I think we have to move on to the next one because I just love horseshoe crabs so much. Has anyone here seen a horseshoe crab? Oh, okay, lots of yeses. Rachel, but, Marianne have seen them. I feel like, Sam. yeah. Yeah, I feel like they are more, you're gonna be more likely to see these than you are to see the mantis shrimp because these actually come on shore. So, oh yeah, and instead, this time, instead of doing the eight fun facts, we're gonna talk about a lot about them and then we're gonna discuss why they're super important and how they're threatened and what we're gonna do about it. So first of all, horseshoe crabs aren't actually crabs. They're much closer related to spiders. This is a phylogenetic tree. So if you remember from earlier, I said that there were three species of, um, of, or three groups of aquatic arthropods. You've got your sea spiders, your horseshoe crabs, and your lobsters, and your crustaceans. So these horseshoe crabs are much closer, close, much closer relations to, wow, words, to the arachnids, so the scorpions and the spiders. Uh, they, so these horseshoe crabs are much closer to the arachnids. And actually the arachnids are very closely related to horseshoe crabs and farther related to the sea spiders. So the terminology and the wording is pretty funny there. But, um, there are currently four species of horseshoe crabs that are still alive today. Uh, there's one species in North America called Limulus polyphemus, and there are three species that live in the Indo-Pacific. All three species have very similar ecology, morphology, and serology. Serology is an examination of their blood serum. So we'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. Horseshoe crabs are ancient. They are, they are even older than the stomatopods. They are the only members of a, uh, of a group of animals that first appeared about 450 million years ago. And they've been around here for a really, really long time. They are the closest living relative to the now extinct group of animals, trilobites, which used to be very, very prevalent in the ancient earth. And you can still find uh, fossils of them all the time. The trilobites were very prevalent at that point in time. So now we're gonna talk about horseshoe crab anatomy because I was like just a little bit on there, but I'm gonna actually stop sharing my screen with you so that I can, I have some samples here that the museum has, so I wanna actually show you to them in person. So I'm gonna stop the sharing. Perfect. Okay. Did that work? Yeah, yeah. You're taking up my whole screen. Cool. So All right. bring out the right. specimens. Okay, cool. So this is a horseshoe crab molt. It's right here. So if you guys can see this, you can tell it's a molt because there's like a gap right here where the horseshoe crab crawled out the top. So horseshoe crabs are, have three different parts. The top part is the, um, I'm gonna, yeah, okay, sorry. The top part is the head or the prosoma. It's actually a cephalothorax and it, it, it houses the eyes and the heart and the brain and the nervous system and the legs and everything. So on the, and it has eyes and we're gonna talk about the eyes in a second. So on the back side of this, on underside of this, you can see all of their legs. So the horseshoe crab has 10 pairs of walking legs on the underside of their bodies. And each ends in a little pincher like that, except the first four do. And then the last one has this, um, it's like a leaf-like structure and it helps the horseshoe crab to burrow, in, burrow into the sediment or move sediments around. The mouth is right at the very center of all of its mouth, uh, all of its legs. And there's little bristles on it that help direct food into the mouth. Now the second part of the body right here, Sorry, I'm being careful with this. Oh, sorry. One more thing about this is that you can tell the difference between a male and a female horseshoe crab by its first pair of walking legs. This is a female, and if you can see, the first pair has the pinchers, just like all the other legs. But males have um, a modification on the first pair, and that's, can you see it here? Um, it's this little boxing yeah. glove thing. So this boxing glove allows it to attach to the female during reproduction, which is pretty cool. So that's, if you ever want to tell the difference between a male and a female, that's the easiest way, but also females tend to be a lot bigger. So, because they molt a couple more times. So the second part of the horseshoe crab is the abdomen. Now this is going to house the gills and some muscles and also some spines on the side. The gills are here and they help, they bring water through and they get the, they are able to get oxygen from the water to give it to the horseshoe crab's body. And it's covered by this, this covering called an operculum, which protects the gills and also covers the genital pores. So all of that is in that region of the horseshoe crab. The gills are super important for that reason, but they also, for larvae, the larvae actually propel themselves using the gills. 
And then finally, you have the tail. The tail is also called the telson. The tail is not a spine. It doesn't hurt. You can pick it up and it's, no, sorry. You can touch it and it's fine. But if you ever find a horseshoe crab on the beach, don't pick it up by its tail because it can pop off and they definitely need the tail because the tail helps them flip back over right side up if, um, if it gets turn upside down. So this is the tail, it's the telson, um, and this is the horseshoe crab anatomy. Now let's briefly talk about their eyeballs. Horseshoe crabs have 10 eyes. So they have a lateral eye right here um, on the sides. That's probably the most uh, prominent eyes, the, the two on the side. Um, and the eyes um, are, can be chemically activated at night to really enhance their vision so that they're able to find uh, their mates because they're going to mate at night. So they're going to they're, they're very good at seeing at night. Behind the lateral eyes is a rudimentary lateral eye, which you can't really see. And then at the front, you see this like bump part here. You can actually see it better on this mold. There's a little bump right at the front, this bump right there. Now that has three eyes on it. And those three eyes all help to detect UV light, which helps the crab follow the lunar cycle, which is important for its life cycle. And finally, or, and there's a few more. So there are two eyes right near its mouth, but the function of those is relatively still unknown. So right now we're already at nine eyes. And the last eye isn't really an eye. The telson just has a lot of photoreceptors on it, which help to synchronize the light in the dark cycle. So it's not really an eye, but we call it an eye as like the 10th eye. And one final thing I want to show you, the gills are, um, are, there's a lot of layers in the gills. So actually in this molt, you can see how they've kind of come apart and you can see all the numerous, numerous layers that are used to help get the oxygen from the water so the crab can use it to breathe. Okay, that is a lot of information about the anatomy. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen again with you right now so that we can talk about the life cycle. Perfect. And while you're doing that, we had a question yeah. which... I certainly did, didn't know the answer to you, but you might. Um, horseshoe crabs, are they the oldest species that is still alive on Earth? You know, that like hasn't gone through many changes and evolved from what it used to be? That is a great question. And I do believe that is true. Elizabeth's gonna check that out and confirm it. But I, that was my understanding, but I could be, but I also, I, it could be that there are other some random species that are around that have been around for longer. But to my knowledge, yes. And we'll know that answer very soon. While I wow, go, okay. Is it true? It is true. Whoa. Is Elizabeth here. She's amazing. <laughs> that is so exciting. Okay, continue. Okay, perfect, guys. Now we're going to talk about the horseshoe crab life cycle. And this is probably the time that you're going to see the horseshoe crabs. So horseshoe crabs typically live in the water for most of their lives. They come onto the shores to mate. In this massive spawning aggregation, the biggest spawning aggregation occurs in the Delaware Bay. So around Delaware and Maryland and New Jersey. So horseshoe crabs spawn according to the lunar and the tidal cycle. They, they, during the spring and the summertime, they all come to the beach a few days before and a few days after the new moon and the full moon at night at high tide. So because of all these characteristics, they're, all of them are able to come. They know, based on the environment, when to come up onto the shore to lay eggs. So the males will use their little boxer appendages to attach to the females. The females will dig a hole in the sand and lay their eggs, and the male will fertilize it. But there's oftentimes not just one male, there's all these males that are around it called satellite males that are also trying to fertilize the egg and in some of uh, the eggs and in some cases that works. So the female can lay up to 120,000 eggs a season in several different trips to the shore in several different batches. Um, and the eggs look like this, this look green, they're green and you find them on the seashore. They're usually buried, but sometimes the waves can wash them up. As they develop, they, the, the shells become clear around the embryo and you can actually see the embryo moving around inside of the shells. And this is a video that I took when I was in grad school, so it's not the best video, but we have these in our lab. So this um, is a clump of the horseshoe crab eggs and they're at the stage where it's very clear. So a lot of this movement that you see down here, the embryos moving in their shells, but some of the larvae are available and you can see one that actually, ah, sorry, don't know what happened. Does that go forward or back? That's okay. Ah, there, I pressed this button, sorry. Um, and you can see the larvae actually move. So if you see that, watch this larvae right here, all these others are moving, and it's going to swim. So during the larval stage, they are mobile in the water. I know it's a terrible video, but you can, it's using its gills, flapping them like this, in order to move through the water column. And so they are not stuck on the bottom. They are moving around and swimming all through. A lot of times they swim upside down. And... For some unknown reason, if you shine them with a UV light, they glow bright green, which is when we were trying to collect them, that's how we found them. 
pretty crazy stuff. <laughs> that is so cute. I have to say, I know you said that was a bad video, but I think it's excellent. I've never seen the larvae swim around like that. And it's so cute. <laughs> I love them. They're so adorable. Wait, I have a cuter video coming up. It's so cute. <laughs> So this is, um, this is the larval, this is the embryo stage, and then they turn into these larvae, and, then, and that takes about a couple of weeks. And then after another couple of weeks, they're gonna molt again into their second instar, at which point they develop their tail and they go to the bottom, and they're really mostly walking across the bottom. And I have a picture, a video. They're so cute. Um, they're like this big, and um, these are different. So you see a couple of them. One of them is bearing through the water, uh, or bearing through the sand. And these are, this one and the one that was over there were probably at different instars. And so the instars are the different molts that they're gonna go through. Um, nope, that's gonna happen again, cool. So as they molt, they're gonna get bigger and bigger. And we have some examples here at the museum of what that looks like. So we have a vial of the eggs and you can see how big they are. I'm gonna shake them up. So you, they're yellow because they're preserved. They're not normally yellow. Um, do you guys see these eggs in here? So they're pretty, pretty small um, and then after they molt a couple of times, they're gonna get a little bit bigger. And so we have them when they're bigger. And the ones that I just showed you in the video are much smaller than this. So this is probably a few months old. And then they molt again and they get bigger and bigger. And the museum has a lot of different samples of these. And they get bigger and bigger as they molt. And then they get really big. <laughs> and you end up with something like this. <laughs> this thing is wow. like way bigger than my head. And this is not even the full horseshoe crab. This is just the cephalothorax. It's missing the, the abdomen and the telson. But can you imagine how gigantic? This is obviously a female because of how gi ginormous she is. And there's nothing on the backside. This is just the molt. They can get massive. So they live to be up to 20 years. They, molt, they reach sexual maturity at about 10 years of age. And they molt about 16 times in their life cycle. But the females molt like two extra times because they get a little bit bigger. And they molt by crawling right out the top of it. And then they mate and they go back and they start the cycle all over again. Pretty crazy. Wow. So these are definitely one of my favorite animals. And they're even, they're, but the reason why they're my favorite is because they're super important for the environment and for human health. So horseshoe crab eggs actually feed migrating shorebirds. I'm going to talk about this animal called the red knot. It's a federally endangered um, species of shorebird, but there's others that experience the same phenomenon, where they have one of the largest and lo longest migration patterns in all the animal kingdom. They spend their winters at the very tip of South America and their summers up in the Arctic for the breeding grounds. And that enormous journey happens every single year, up and back down again. And the biggest stopover and the most important one is right in the Delaware Bay, which is, and they've evolved to, to match the flyover time at the time of the horseshoe crab spawn so that they can land and they can gorge themselves on horseshoe crab eggs and they can double their weight in a very short amount of time in order to make that final journey up to the breeding grounds. So these birds are endangered. They are, um, there are fewer and fewer coming back each year, so we don't know if it's something to do with the horseshoe crabs or what, but um, learning more about this ecosystem and this, this whole phenomenon is really important. So horseshoe crabs are really important for the environment, but they're also incredibly important for humans. So horseshoe crabs have blue blood. Now, this blue blood is because the, in, humans have red blood because we have he, um, hemoglobin that moves the oxygen in our bloodstream. However, uh, horseshoe crabs have blue blood because they have hemocyanin to carry their oxygen, and that contains copper, which makes it blue. Now, hemocyanin has a substance within it called limulus amoebocyte lysate, limulus coming from the name of the horseshoe crab. Now, LAL, or as it's known, is a, it coagulates or it kind of like solidifies itself when it's exposed to bacterial toxins. So researchers collect the horseshoe crab eggs, or I'm so sorry, back up. They collect the horseshoe crab blood and they use it as a simple, reliable test for bacterial contamination, for medical equipment, and any injectable medicines like vaccines. And as you might imagine, this is really important in today's world as we're trying to find a vaccine for COVID-19. And when we come up with a vaccine, we're gonna have to use horseshoe crab blood on all of those vaccines. There are currently people that are looking into creating a synthetic alternative, but that's not fully developed right now. So we're still relying very heavily on LAL from horseshoe crab blood. Now, because of this, horseshoe crab blood is extremely expensive. And it looks like this. Sorry, I forgot. I have a vial of this. It is amazing. Whoa. And you want to take a guess at how much a gallon of horseshoe crab blood is worth. One gallon. This is not a gallon, but one <laughs> gallon of horseshoe crab blood. Does anyone have an idea? Deb says a lot. It's worth a lot. 
Mm -hmm. And can, can you can you hold up that that gallon again? Just or no, no I know it's not, not a gallon. gallon. Sorry, but uh, yeah, no, that's okay. Okay, so people are saying eight hundred dollars for a gallon, maybe fifty, one thousand uh, dollars, two hundred, one hundred. Jennifer thinks twelve hundred. Deb says fifteen hundred. Have we gotten close? Nope, not even not even remotely close. The okay, answer, Nicholas says fifty thousand. That's the closest. It's actually sixty thousand dollars for a gallon of horseshoe club blood. This is probably expired, so it's not worth that much. But like, it is amazing. This stuff is phenomenal, and it's so important because we have to use so much of it for every. If you've ever had a vaccine, if you've ever had a surgery, a injection, an injection, an implant, any anything that has been put into the human body has been tested with with horseshoe crab blood. All of it. Horseshoe crabs are so important. Um, and this process takes out about 30% of their blood each time. And the mortality rate is about 15%. So we do need it, but it is hurting their population numbers. So we're trying, you know, a synthetic alternative would be great. So yeah, again, and, and, oh, sorry. Sorry, um, that actually brings me to a great question that Deb asked in the chat. Um, what are the bioethics protocols around um, handling this kind of application for their blood. That's you, a great part. Oh. Yeah. How do they minimize how many of them die? That's a great question. There's, um, I'm sure that there are better sources than me to talk about all of that. I know that one of the things that they try to do is they collect the, um, the horseshoe crabs from a different place that they drop them off in the hopes that they aren't going to collect the same horseshoe crab each time. But, um, and I, and there's all these safety procedures. I mean, 85% of them live, which could be good, but in my personal opinion, I think that that's, you know, that's a lot that mm -hmm. uh, the mortality rate is rather high. Um, and I'm sure that there are other safety precautions that I don't know full of. I know that they tried not to, to collect the same horn crab a bunch of times in a row. Um, but one of the questions that our research at my lab had was, do horseshoe crabs imprint on a beach? So if you are collecting from the same beach each time, are the horse, same horseshoe crabs going back to that beach? But we don't know the answer to that yet. So there are a lot of questions still to be had about this, but um, it is extremely important. Yeah. Yeah. So it does sound like, um, you know, like a, like you said, a synthetic version of this would be ideal. Um, oh, and Rachel points out that there's some research at UGA um, Marine Extension about farming horseshoe crabs for this purpose. Um, and Deb pointed out they can tag them and trace them. So tagging them, of course, so that they can mark who they have already um, collected blood from so that they don't draw blood again. Perfect. And man, lots of fun uh, people with like who have had fun jobs here in the chat. Um, Deb did a thesis for RFID chips on cane toads, has worked with herps. That's great. Um, and Molly, I just wanted to point out that we're at 545, and I think... We have gotten to all of our questions. Um, Mark did have a question earlier about why there were so many dead uh, horseshoe crabs washed up on shore, and Elizabeth answered that. I just want to point out that Elizabeth said that sometimes these, you know, dead horseshoe crabs are actually um, shed exoskeletons or molts, but that they can, you know, that they are vulnerable to the summer heat, and so sometimes that can cause, like, a, I guess a mass, you know, kind of death of the horseshoe crabs. Um, but yeah, did you want to add anything else about horseshoe crabs before we move on? Uh, that's great. The last few slides are just about why they're threatened and what we can do about them. Um, but basically they're threatened because of shoreline erosion and human development on the shores and all of that is going to be influenced by it. I'm kind of spinning through this so that we can get to the decorator crabs. They are harvested for the eel, eel, eel and whelk fisheries. So managing that harvest is really important. And then finally, what you can do, you can uh, partic you can flip them over. A lot of times they get stranded on the beach. So if you see them, flip them over, not by their telsons though. Participate in surveys. And there's a website called horseshoecrab.org that is a phenomenal website for everything horseshoes and it's oh, horseshoe crabs. And it's run by a conservation organization. So check it out if you want every single question you want answered about horseshoe crabs. Questions? That's, that is awesome. Um, I do want to say that we can email all of the registrants with this information because I think we would all love to know how we can continue helping horseshoe crabs. Um, and I believe there are some other resources that we, that Molly has created that we can email to you, yes. um, Molly and Elizabeth. But yes, I will let you move on. And I didn't mean to rush you, by the way. I think no. we're all having so much fun learning about these things. <laughs> um, 
when I was practicing it, I, I didn't know how much interaction there would be, and I, I would trade any, I wouldn't trade anything for being able to interact with you guys. So this is perfect with me. Yeah, keep the questions coming, keep them yes. coming. Um, but yeah, decorator okay. crabs, let's go. We're gonna we're gonna speed through this, guys. Buckle your seatbelts. Okay, decorator <laughs> crabs. I don't know if you guys can think of any super famous decorator crabs, but you might be able to think of this one from Moana, who is actually not a decorator crab. He's a coconut crab, but he does decorate, so it kind of gives you the idea about decorations. Now. We're not in this section really going to be talking about the biology of decorator crabs. We're really just focusing on that decorating behavior. So decorator crabs are incredible. We have a, yeah, okay. So they're incredible. They are all different types of spider crabs. So there are like 900 species of spider crabs and about 75% of those decorate at some point in their life. But before we get deep into decoration, let's talk about why they might decorate. And we go back to the ecology of predators versus prey. Now, if you think about things, you know, predators versus prey, there are a lot of ways that the prey might be able to react to a predator, either how to keep a predator from detecting it, how to escape from, from a predator if it does detect it, and how to survive an attack by a predator. So some of those strategies, and you can think about them in your head, is, this is a very short list, but there's a gazillion strategies, are fight or flight, the typical one that we think about. There's also hiding in a shelter or deception, maybe like, an, like a possum plays dead, so it deceives their, um, the predator. Intimidation, maybe it's posturing to make itself look a lot bigger, or camouflage, so it's hiding in plain sight. Maybe it has mimicry, which is an involved uh, similarity between organisms, so it looks like something's venomous, but it's actually not. Misidentification, where the predator doesn't even realize it's a crab. Chemical defense, where it's going to have toxic uh, substances that are emitted from it, so that it actually is dangerous to the predator. Unpalatability, it just tastes gross. It could be difficult to catch where it's got uh, like a lizard whose tail pops off or it could have defensive structures like spines or shells. So then we take all of those options and we put it in the scope of decorating. And decorating is so effective because it can combine so many of those different strategies together. For example, camouflage, it looks like something different. It all, decorating also can be used for misidentification. It looks like it, it might look like an urchin instead of a decorator crab. Chemical defense, maybe they are decorating with an algae that is toxic to the predator, or maybe all of the things that, are, that they are decorating with are able to block the chemical smell or the, yeah, the smell of the decorator crab so that it actually smells like a sponge and not like a crab. It could be, it, the decorations could make it taste bad. The decorations could make it difficult to catch. Maybe a predator comes by and tries to go for the sponge, pulls the sponge off the decorator crab, giving the decorator crab time to escape. Defensive structures, obviously like this spine. So the ability to combine all of these different predator evasion and predator like hiding techniques makes decoration so incredibly efficient. But it, defense against predation is not the only reason that they might decorate. It also provides surplus food. They can eat their decorations if they're in an area <laughs> where they can have a lot of food. Or it can help them to hide from or attract prey. Decorator crabs are often nocturnal, so they're very still during the day. And then they move around at night. So when they're still, maybe a shrimp comes by and they're like, that's a nice sponge to live in. And then the decorator crab's like, no, you have a snack now. But a lot of times the, the, the decorator crab, the things that live on the decorator crab, because they're often still alive, have a mutualistic relationship with the decorator crab, where the decorator crab's eating and any of the scraps can get eaten by the animals that live on its back. But how does the decorator crab actually decorate? It is covered with bristle-like hairs called setae that cover their whole body. And sometimes they're straight and sometimes they're hooked. But the hooked ones are the on the areas that they're going to decorate with and those hook ones act a lot like velcro so or they're going to be able to put it on there just like velcro and like velcro they're easy to get removed because remember these are crustaceans these are crustaceans so and like all arthropods they're going to shed their exoskeleton so they wouldn't want to decorate all nice and pretty and then have to shed their exoskeleton they want to be able to take all of those decorations off that old skeleton and put it on their new one so it's a lot I know we're going fast. I'm just keeping track of the time. Um, now we have a fun game that we really want to play really fast. Let's go back to camouflage. How important camouflage is for this and how effective it is. These are all different types of bugs, terrestrial bugs, that are using camouflage. What I have coming up is a series of pictures that has a decorator crab in it. And I want to see if you guys can point to the decorator crab in these images, on your computer, on your TV, whatever it is. Do you love, love it? To see the decorator crab. Okay, so if you see the decorator crab, point to it and then say yes in the chat. <laughs> I think I think I see it, but I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna show you in three, two, one. There it is. 
So its head is, or its body is here and all its legs are coming off, but obviously it's very well decorated. It's very, I mean, you would, it would be very hard to find that animal, especially if it doesn't even smell like a decorated crab anymore. How about this one? This one's harder for me. <laughs> it's decorating incredibly well. Yeah. Okay, but we've had people saying yes. Preston okay. said yes, Rachel, yeah. Okay, some cool. confident folks in here. Here we go. That's where it is. So it's a little bit of a different color sponge, but you can tell it's actually taking sponge from what it's on, putting it on its body. So it really, really matches that sponge. How about wow. this? We're going kind of fast on these because it's exciting, but um, can you guys point to the decorator crab? Maybe this is let's, easy. Let's give them just a, another minute. I can definitely or, do that. Not I'm literally. But I, I want to make sure that there's time. Okay. I'm done. Yeah, no, no worries. No worries. Okay. We've had a ton of people who have found it. So, or think that they've found it. <laughs> okay. This one might be easier. Yep. So its eyeball is right here. It's got its like nose part. It's called a rostrum. It's right here. And then its legs are kind of sticking out. And it's obviously all of it's surrounded by these anemones. So it fits in really well. All right. I'm not, I'm going to wait. Oh, Ruxin says no, but iPad and Deb have found it. Okay, Otto and Jennifer have found it. Preston's found it, Marianne. All right, I think you need to show me though, because I'm not sure. It is right here. So the, the, the body is here and you've got the legs that are kind of coming off here. The legs are also, you can kind of see the end of its leg right there and it's end of its leg right here. So it's kind of spread out against this surface like that. This is also a decoration that's on top of it. So that should have been probably included with it, but the actual body of the crab is right here. Obviously these decorator crabs are very good at camouflage. I'm like, I'm like, how did they even discover, you know, these things? <laughs> Uh, this is all this person named Jackie Hildering. I just found her website and it's full of pictures like this. So this is very hard oh, to pick the best ones. That's a good resource. Mm -hmm. And we, we had a great question um, that Elizabeth has answered. I'm just going to repeat it. Um, how do they learn to decorate? And uh, it's, Elizabeth says that decorator crabs use instinct in order to properly camouflage themselves to match their environments. So like their parents don't necessarily teach them how um, it's just kind of something that they know as a species. Okay, and we've got lots of people who have found this one. Okay, McKenna and Michaela, yeah. So you guys see it? Its legs are really skinny, but it's on this ground, so it looks a lot like um, the, it's, it's decorating with all this leafy algae, so it looks just like a leafy algae, but if you can see right here, you see its legs. Great job, guys. Okay, <laughs> this one. I think this might be the last one. There might be more. I think this is the last one, though. Yeah, like, okay, can I ask you something, Molly? Yeah. I think I might see it. Is its mouth going kind of like, is it making that face? <laughs> um, I maybe, I actually, I'm not going to lie, I very much struggle with this one. This okay. one's very hard. It's hard to find the exact spaces of them. So are you guys good for me to show you? I, I think so. Some have not found it. Some said it was really easy. So let's, let's see where it is. Okay, so it's right here. The best way is to see their legs. I find their legs a lot easier than anything else. The main part of their body is here. Trying to figure out exactly where the eyes and the mouth and stuff are actually kind of challenging, but it's easiest if you're looking for the legs. So, good to um, know. Uh, oh, sorry, what? I just said that's good to know. Okay. If we have to do this again. <laughs> yeah. Um, there are so many images. I, I could have pulled 20 of these, but I was like, no, keep, constrain yourself, restrain yourself. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I think that's the last one. I'm going to, I think so. Okay. So really quickly in our lab that we, what we were studying, one of the guys in our lab, one of the researchers in our lab wanted to find out more about decorator crabs and he wanted to find out how how fast they decorate what parts of their body they decorate do they decorate to match their background and to do this to find out more about this he needed a standardized thing for them all to decorate with so what he used was pom-poms does anyone use pom-poms in crafts in arts and crafts <laughs> so these pom-poms he put them in the in the tank and they were able to decorate with it i actually have a video and i'll play the video while i continue talking about this so this is a video of them decorating with the black pom-pom i want to draw attention that there's only one black pom-pom back here keep that in your mind okay so right now it's like 
moving it around on its mouth and it's like preparing it and then it's going to stick it onto its leg and you can watch that whole process now what he wanted to determine was is it going to decorate more when it's in a shelter he had a thousand questions and he answered a bunch of them i'm not going to go through them all but one of the things was that yes they decorate more when there's not shelter available which makes sense and they decorate more their back of their bodies than the front of their bodies probably also because they want to have moved room to move around but also because they want to be able to, uh, they, when they are in a shelter, they're oftentimes, at least in our lab, they were in the shelter head first. So their backs were sticking out. So they wanted to make sure their back legs were covered with the decoration. And now you see there are two pom-poms on the back of this decorator crab, of the back leg of the decorator crab. So it really rubs it in there really tightly, just like Velcro. You're not gonna just like lightly put Velcro down. You're gonna like rub it and make sure that it's perfectly in there. So that's exactly what he does to decorate. So that's a video of them decorating. And yes, we did decorate them um, green, or they decorated them red and green, maybe for Christmas. That's a great Christmas card. <laughs> um, so that's actually it. I, the last thing I was gonna talk about is that you'll get an email after at the end of this. And uh, with some fun activities, we've made an activity page for each of the different species that you learned about today. Some of them are coloring pages and everything. So, oh, it stopped sharing, okay. Um, one of the projects in there um, is, is actually an activity where you can decorate a decorator crab, help this crab decorate. So some of ours, you de we decorated them with like corals and algae and all of that like normal or you could decorate it with your imagination. So use pom-poms, use glitter. One of ours had like a can on the top and it was reminding people to recycle. And another one of them had like, um, like a terrarium that had terrestrial arthropods in it that was on vacation. So I want you guys to use your imagination and decorate it as much as you want. Be realistic, be fantastical, use your imagination and have fun. Make a story of it, whatever. And then, <laughs> uh, the last slide was thanks to Elizabeth especially because she did so much work for this and for all of you guys for coming and for the hosts and everything. Yes, thank you. Thank you again, um, everyone for coming and Elizabeth and Molly for being our awesome presenters. I want to agree with Nicholas. Um, this was one of the most exciting presentations for Bug Fest and um, very informative and you are infectiously enthusiastic. I love that. Um, and everyone is looking forward to that email with all of the extra resources. We're also gonna throw Martha Martha, I'm so sorry, Molly and Elizabeth's emails into the chat um, so that if you want, if you can think of more questions, you can email them with some questions. So I know we had some that we did not, um, that we did not answer. Oh, and iPad is asking about the pistol shrimp. We did just, we did figure out the pistol shrimp is a different species. Okay. Yes. Also another very cool species though that everyone should look up. Um, all right, and so Sam has put into the chat their contact information. Check your email for, you know, those awesome resources and the coloring pages and the decorator crab activities. And um, have fun with the rest of BugFest. We've got some awesome programs coming up still. Uh, party at your porch light. There's one happening right after this program. And of course, don't forget to get your BugFest t-shirt because nothing, nothing is as exciting as a BugFest t-shirt, right? To help you remember, uh, our virtual infestation <laughs> and you can do so by going to bugfest.org if you join or renew your museum membership by today you can get a free t-shirt uh, we want to say thank you so much to our sponsors Terminix and BASF for helping make Bugfest happen um, and of course everyone don't forget that next week the museum is actually resuming its operations and you can reserve a free ticket to actually go into the exhibits and into the building and explore the exhibits. And um, maybe you will see Molly or Elizabeth as they work on some of our aquariums because that's what they do in their jobs. So again, thank you everyone so much for coming and I hope you guys have a great day.